Yes, you read the title right. I'm revisiting Lizzie Borden again. <laughs> Here on Big Pretty Man. Hi, and welcome back to Big Pretty Man, a channel for the extra large man who wants to live his life large and in charge. I'm your host, Timothy Big Pretty Crow, a wardrobe and lifestyle consultant for the extra large man. And yes, gentlemen, <laughs> once again, I am doing uh, Lizzie Borden. This will be my third video. You know, the last time I said, you know, and that's all I have for Lizzie Borden. Well, apparently not. <laughs> and the reason for this video is because I got so many great questions and great comments uh, on the last video I did about a little over a month ago uh, that I that some some issues came up that I didn't say that I wish I'd said and um, so and some uh, perspectives that I don't think that many of you have heard uh, and I thought you know I, I really wish I'd cover those so I'm like you know what all right Lizzie Borden for I promise <laughs> the last time <laughs> maybe <laughs> but either way let's get going with it now as I was saying I got a lot of really good questions and got into a lot of really good discussions about uh, about these murders in the comments of of the last video and you know it really made me start thinking about a few of the issues that I didn't bring up and uh, but also got a few <laughs> ridiculous assertions um, one particularly I have to mention was that I actually had a lady say Oh, the, this murder has a male hallmark all over it. Women do not murder like this. What? Did this comment come through time from the Victorian age? That was a horribly misogynistic and sexist comment. And to that, I'll, if, to that I'll say that. If you do not believe that women are capable of this type of grisly, brutal murder, I'll just give you three names. Bill Guinness, Eileen Warnos, and what and my favorite, Catherine Knight. Especially look up Catherine Knight. Then tell me women aren't capable of this type of grisly murder. Okay? Now that out of the way, um, some of the, a lot of the comments that came out were asking talking about the blood and talking about the blood evidence. You know, that there was no blood on her. Nobody saw blood. And there, if she did it, there had to be at least some blood somewhere on her. Her hair, her face. She couldn't have got all that blood off. Hard, blood's hard, hard to get off, which is very true. However, one thing I'd like to point out, and something I didn't go over in the other videos, is that you're, we're thinking of this blood evidence from a 21st century uh, mentality. You know, from... Uh, uh, from a generation of people that are used to watching CSI and forensic files and or even the knowledge of you know for forensic work and forensic investigation but you have to put these murders in the in the time frame that they were and in the era that which was the Victorian era right toward the end of Victorian era and got to think of the sensibilities and the completely different outlook that they had at the time. Also, the, si the, the level of, of science there at the time. Now, for, for one, uh, people would be like, you know, well, there had to be blood on her. You know, why didn't they find, you know, uh, she, you know she, they, there should have been something on her. Well, you know what? There very well may have been. Even if she washed up, if you go by the theory that I give, that she may have used that coat and then took it off, and, you know, there, if there was some blood sputter on her face or her hands, she could have washed that off. And I agree, there may still be a little bit of blood, blood evidence left. But, folks, this was the Victorian age. For one, you know, and this is, there's been comments made about this before. For one, if that happened today, they would make Lizzie Borden, uh, they'd have had a female officer go with her and they'd have stripped her down and give her an examination at a hospital or on, you know, and they would have sent her close to a forensic lab where they had went over it with a fine tooth comb. You know, um, that didn't happen back then. There were just certain things that were not done in the Victorian era. And one was to, to, cert, to do a body search on a lady. And not only a lady, but a woman from a, a, a good family. 
from a you know from from uh, uh, with a good reputation in the town. This was Fall River, 1892. No one, you didn't put your hands on a lady. That just didn't happen. You know, you're talking about a, a society that if you went to, a, if a woman went to a doctor, she went with a female chaperone. If the doctor had to listen to her heart, they would have her sister or her, her female chaperone hold the stethoscope to her chest. The man would turn his head and listen to the heartbeat because he couldn't touch her. That just wasn't done. So there was no way any uh, any police officer coming into that room was going to be like, yeah, let, I need to give you a physical examination. Oh, that would have been horribly scandalous to a group that were shocked if you wore white after Labor Day. Literally, it would have been not just a faux pas, but a scandal. That's not going to happen. And on top of that, even the police... You know, they were of this era, too, and there was just certain things not done. For instance, you know, we have, well, they searched the house. They couldn't find the murder weapon. Well, they, you know, well, here's one thing. There was, there were some places they were never going to look, namely in the chest of drawers, because for fear that they may see the, the ladies' unmentionables, their slips and their panties, their bloomers. Oh, that that just that wouldn't even been dreamed of, and actually, you know, you say, well, you may be going a little too far here, Tim. Not really, because if you you know if you think about it, uh, it matches with what happened. Because, for instance, we know three days after the crime, we have the burning of the dress incident. This dress that was covered apparently in reddish paint. Why wasn't that found when they searched the house? Where was where was this dress? So that right there, you know, all, you know. So that right there shows that there were certain places they just didn't look, and apparently, it's in drawers where they kept their clothes. So, the fact they couldn't find the murder weapon, well, Lizzie Borden could have stuck, took that axe and stuck it in her panty drawer, and nobody would have ever found it. And the thing is, she was an intelligent Victorian woman. She knew that no one was going to, no one was going to give her a body search. It wouldn't even went through her mind. If you, so long as she didn't have blood dripping off her face, nobody's going to give her an examination, nor are they going to ask her to strip off her clothes. Oh, my. Once again, Victorian age, 1892. That wasn't going to happen. And in fact, it was another five days before they even asked to see the dress she was wearing. And of course, she said, sure, and she produced a beautifully laundered dress. So it could have, you know, there could have been some, 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 bits of blood. There could have been there, but there, no one was going to ask a Victorian woman to strip or to give her a body exam. So that evidence very well could be there, but for the time they were never going to find it. you got to keep that in mind. And I'll, while I'm on that, we have to talk about the police a little bit. The, the fact that they didn't find the dress you know, and uh, you know, when it bought, three days later we have this her burning it, which brought on the entire trial. That's what she's tried for. That was evident is that she burned a dress three days later, like she's hiding evidence. Well, that's the you know, why didn't they find this dress? Well, you know, not and why didn't they ask her to take her clothes? You know, and, and for three days later, but also you know, they people's like well, they didn't find the the the, the murder weapon. Well. You know, the axe that was found, which was inconclusive as whether or not it was the actual hatchet used in the murder. Uh, it, originally, when the police were searching the house, a police officer found it and put it back. Another cop coming along, another police officer coming along, found it again, and he put it into evidence. So, you know, in these type of conditions, in these type of police... It's, you know, we who knows what was best. And, you know, I, I don't really want to come down on these police officers. This was 1892. For, there was no fingerprint evidence at the time. There was, there was no blood evidence or DNA or any of that. And also, these police officers, Fall River did not have major murders. You know, they mostly dealt with, you know, uh, bar, bar brawls, you know, um, and maybe occasional, you know, um, break-in burglary or prostitution they weren't really geared they didn't really have a homicide unit like they'd have today so they're just doing the best that they could do 
So, you know, the fact they moved bodies, that, the, you know, moved the bodies around uh, before they took the pictures, the fact that they, they you know, they didn't collect, collect the clothes for blood evidence, that they really didn't search the house very thoroughly. Not, not only are they a product of their time, and they weren't going to go through people's drawers, you know, literally, <laughs> and make women strip, but also they really, there was no guideline for, for and, and no experience for this type of crime. And I think we have to take that into consideration. Now, in my first video, we, t you know, we talked about the crime and the crime details of who was there, who wasn't. And in the second video, I really kind of knocked out of the park the whole ideas of an outside intruder coming in. Whether it be a, a burglar come in that kill, killed the, the Bordens or that it was some sort of angered um, business associate or renter of Mr. Borden come in the house and kill them. I kind of showed how that just doesn't work on a lot of levels. You know, it was, the middle of the, it was uh, between 9 and 11 in the morning, bright summer day. It was actually on a Thursday. And, you know, with people walking up and down the streets and someone sneaking in the house and coming out without blood on them is just not, just not feasible. It doesn't make any sense. Nobody goes robs a house at 11 o'clock in the morning <laughs> with people at home. And if you're going to ki kill your landlord, you, you, you catch him out on the street or you break his house at night. You don't go in with people at home, middle of the day, kill his wife and wait for him and then kill him. So I went over all that, you know, in the last video. So I covered anybody outside, but I got a lot of questions and a lot and a lot of assertions and beliefs from people talking about the people we know were inside the house, uh, at least throughout that day. And saying, I think that John Morris did it. I think that that uh, Bridget Sullivan, the maid, I think that she was behind it or involved in it somehow. I even got that, hey, I think Emma's the one. I think she snuck back and kill, killed her father. So I thought, you know what, because I've covered outside the house, let's cover the people that were, that were in that house that day or, you know, or that lived in that house. Okay, well, the first, the first one I'm going to start off with is, was Emma Borden, just to knock it out of the way. I've actually heard a crazy theory, and it's with no support whatsoever. That you know she could have grabbed a horse from Fairhaven, rode the 15 miles back that morning, killed her father, then rode back to get the news, and then then take a carriage back. That's just ridiculous. She was staying with friends, friend. You know everyone knew she was out of town, and this is not like she had a race car, folks, to run up there kill her. And once again, nobody saw her return. She had had return on this horse or in a buggy. Nobody saw her come back. You know, nobody saw her come around. This 42-year-old woman that lived in the house, pull up. Nobody noticed her buggy. They noticed uh, um, Bridget running out of the house, uh, you know, uh, this few minutes after the murder. They didn't see the, 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 uh, this buggy or this horse of her charging up and then charging out. You know, th this has no basis in fact whatsoever, uh, nor even in, nor in logic. So, uh, and there, there was testimony, there was support that everyone knew that, Emma was staying with some friends in, in, in Fairhaven, 15 miles away. So she, of all people to be suspected, she has the most rock-solid al alibi. She was not even in town. That's really gris grasping at some illogical straws. Now, the other one, I hear this a lot. Oh, well, I think it was John Morris. It's very odd that he showed up, just happened to show up the night before, and he didn't have any, any luggage and, you know, and all of that. Well... I do think that that's odd, and uh, that he showed up that particular. It doesn't seem like, from what I've read, it doesn't seem like this was a planned visit. However, looking at his history, and he's a little bit of a mysterious person anyway. We don't know a lot about him. Um, this was not odd for him. He had been known to pop up the house before. Um, you know, what well, now this whether or not he or he had um, um, luggage, whether he brought a bag with him, really haven't been able to confirm one way or the other. Um, but, you know, from what we do know of him, he had been a farmer and a horse trader. And, it, you know, reading, reading his accounts and, and what was going on, he was there actually at the time he was visiting a niece and nephew. Um, he did, a lot of people brought an uh, issue up that when they asked him, he, he could actually give the badge number for the tro trolley conductor um, on his way. Well, and people like, oh, that's a very convenient nod. Uh, you know, once again, 1892, 
there are no cell phones there are no no television there is no radio you know only thing that people really had as a distraction is either like part of games or reading so people paid a lot more attention in their day and I don't think it's that odd that you know taking this trolley he noticed the the conductors uh, number uh, you know, I think that I, I do think that's just a lucky draw for him and it did happen to be the man that was working people's like well how do you remember the the badge number well the fact that he did remember the badge number, they confirmed that the guy was working is a pretty good alibi he, he was there so uh, you know and and the relatives that confirmed they saw him that day so uh, around that time so uh, John Morris is really is in the clear why did he show up was he maybe looking for to borrow some money or something um, or trying to, you know, from either uh, uh, from, from, from Andrew Borden, possibly, or from one of his relatives. Was it some sort of business deal? We really don't know. So, but either way, he, it's got a, pretty, a very solid alibi that he was not there. He had left at least an hour before that uh, Abby was murdered. And we know by the time that, uh, that Andrew was killed that he was, was visiting with relatives and nowhere to be seen. And, he, and he, so he's ruled out as well. I mean, I hear, I hear a, lot, a lot about that, um, but he's ruled out. Now, and then, of course, there's all the speculation with uh, Bridget Sullivan. I hear that one a lot. Oh, they had to be, the two, two women had to be in on this. She, she had to be part of, which is actually the, the plot of the 2018 uh, movie Lizzie with Chloe Sevigny. Uh, you know, so that her and the maid were having some sort of lesbian affair, and I'm going to cover this stuff a little bit later, um, and that they, they hatched a murder plan. In all truth, if you read the, uh, the, all of the testimony given in, 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 the, court, the, uh, in the court transcripts uh, or the inquest tra and the inquest transcripts from, from Bridget uh, and from Lizzie, you, know, you do not get any sense that she had anything to do with it at all. Now, did she know, did, was there something that she caught? Actually, from what I've read of what she said, I don't think so. Uh, I think that she was the one person that, if Lizzie's the murderer, and I think she is, that she, you know, that'd be the one wild card that she would make covered. And there is some evidence to that. Because, and I will say this, the, the uh, Elizabeth Montgomery movie, Legend of, of Lizzie Borden, except for her being naked, got a lot of their facts right. In fact, they use a lot of the court transcripts for that movie. And one thing that I did notice in, um, a couple things I noticed in Bridget Sullivan's testimony, um, I'll, one of them I'll bring up later, which is very interesting, was that, you know, in this very, detail, this very detailed uh, um, description she gave, she did say that on two occasions when she was cleaning those windows um, outside, Lizzie asked her, uh, are you going to be outside washing the window? She said yes. And she told her, you don't need to, you can lock the door if you want to. Um, you know, you can leave it unlocked if you want to because I'm going to be out here. In other words, she'll see anybody that come in. And, you know, or you can latch it if you want to. I can get water from the barn. And then later on, like uh, after she'd already started washing the window, she said, are you still going to be out there? She actually come and asked her twice. How much long? How are you going to be? You, how much long are you going to be out there? Are you going to be there? So she was checking to see if she was going to be staying outside. And of course, Lizzie's alone in the house with Mrs. Borden. Why? So it seems like she's almost checking to make sure she's not going to get interrupted. Why else would she go ask her twice? Are you going to be out, Are you going to be outside? You want me to latch the door? Uh, are you still going to be outside? How much longer? Why was she? Why was she worrying about this? What was she up to? And that also brings me to something else. I got a lot of uh, questions, or uh, saying, "Well, you're saying she wore the coat when she killed her father, um, but did she? What about with her mother? You know? Well, here's the thing. The reason I never brought that up was because with the mother, from what we can tell from Bridget's testimony and even in Lizzie's testimony, is that. Bridget was outside for, when they asked Bridget how long we were outside, she said she really hadn't looked at the clock. She wasn't really sure. But just from her description, and she gave, like I said, she gave a very good description of how many, what she did and how many pails of water she used 
to wash the windows and how she washed the windows. Uh, just reading that description, she went and got wa pumped water four times. So we can guess, and we know that she was in the house, and she said, I know that I was there um, when, when, um, when Mr. Borden come home. So we know that she, you know, I don't know how, we don't know how long she'd already been back of the house by that point, but we know that it does, if you do, it seems like about an hour, at least 45 minutes minimum, to pump, to get four pails of water to scrub the, the, the front and back windows. Yeah, at least, at least an hour. Which would kind of make sense because she went out around nine o'clock, you know, she'd been back in the house maybe 10, 10, 15, you know, and then he came home like 15, 20 minutes later. So that kind of fits the timeline. Well, that would give Lizzie an hour to kill her, her, um, to kill her, uh, her stepmother and then wash up. So we, the, the, an hour, we don't have, we don't have to worry about the time crunch. Whereas with Andrew, which is why I went over it, is why wasn't there blood on her from that? Because she had such a limited time. Once again, um, Bridget said that she went upstairs. She that he got home about twenty minutes till till eleven. She went upstairs, lay down. She heard the the bell st strike, and just a few minutes later, she heard Lizzie call for her and say her father was dead. So Lizzie Hadley had about fifteen to twenty minutes to commit that murder. There is a time crunch as far as the blood. How did she how did she get that blood off kill him and get that blood off her that quick with her father? But with her mother, she had an hour. She could have been wearing her best dress and went up there and chopped her to death. She got an hour to go take the dress off and take a full bath if she wants. So the, the, there's not a time crunch there. There's not a time issue with the murder of the mother. However, I do think it's very interesting with the mother that she was alone with the house and she kept checking to see if Maggie was going to come in the house, or Bridget, they called her Maggie sometimes, if she was going to come back in the house and kept asking her. And I think that the movie version they had on that with Elizabeth Montgomery, at least the, at least the timing, I think they got that right. Now, I've heard a lot of questions about, like, well, whatever happened to, to, to Bridget? Whatever happened to John Morse? Well, um, um, and did they, anybody, did, especially with Bridget, did she ever confess to this? There was rumors that she confessed, that she, that she said, said something. Well, there's a little bit of truth, or at least rumor, in that. Um, uh, it looks like, what, what, from what we do know, is that, that Bridget Sullivan, she was 25 at the time of the murders, and about 26 by the time of the trials was over. She did go back to Ireland. She was Irish, and she had been there about six years already. She came when she was like about 20. And so, but she went back to Ireland, but not for very long, because by, um, by, the, by, 18, by 1897, she is, um, we know that she, she had come back, returned to America, and had moved to Montana, uh, out to, towards Butte, actually a town called Anaconda, and she, and she was living there. And she basically lived out in Montana the rest of her life. Uh, she did end up marrying a man ironically named John Sullivan, and she kept, I wish she'd have changed her maiden name. <laughs> so, um, and she pretty much lived a very quiet life. Um, so we know she did do some domestic service for, for a judge in the town, was very well liked in the community, and she never talked about uh, the Lizzie Borden case. Every now and then, people that knew her, mostly nieces and nephews, she never had any children of her own, would say that she would talk and tell stories and talk about uh, a Lizzie who she had worked for. And apparently, from everything she said, um, she was very she is very fond and liked both Lizzie and Emma. They got along, got along quite well. So these were a bit older than her, uh, but she seemed to have got along with them quite well. Um, but, and she never talked about the murders. The, there is a story that uh, a friend of hers, um, she, when she was very sick and dying, she called for her and to talk to her and that she had said something to the effect of, I helped out uh, Lizzie in that, all that trial. And, but then when she talked about the, that was really, but she wouldn't say anything else about it. That was really kind of ambiguous. She, you know, um, and when her, when her friend asked about her the next day in the hospital, she's like, she, she didn't want to talk about it at all. And she said, you know, just please just drop it. You know, I don't, don't, don't want to bring this up. And, uh, and she, and she lived, and she, she died in 1948, pretty ripe, fairly ripe away, you know, I think it was in the late sixties. Um, but what exactly did she mean? One is this friend of hers telling the truth. He always has a question of that. 
because um, she did tell it to a woman who's writing a book. Um, and, you know, what exactly did she mean when she said she helped her out? She didn't say she lied. She could have just meant, you know, I went, when I got from the, the, she may have believed she was completely innocent and just told him, said, you know, this is what I see. And she may have seen that as a help to her. Or maybe it could mean something else. We're never going to know. Uh, but personally, I don't think that um, from from the timeline, the way things happen, it does look like Lizzie avoided her seeing or knowing anything. And it was a very convenient that she was outside. The whole We know she was outside for, for Abby's birth, so she didn't see that. And we know, you know, and she was upstairs. And I think this was, that this is per, this was on purpose. Uh, she didn't want her want her involved and so I really don't think that she, that um, Bridget could give any more insight than she did on the stand um, at the time I, you know I don't think that she knew any more than what she didn't already tell I don't think she had any inside information and there is no evidence of any type of affair between the two women uh, she did you know she did marry later on now John Morris um, he ended up in Iowa uh, on a farm, become a farmer, lived a fairly quiet life, nothing eventful, uh, and, and and he passed away there. So really, no, not much of a mystery mystery there. Um, and you know, even though we hear all these stories, that you know that uh, it seems to be just that it's just stories. And speaking of just stories, <laughs> um, that's going to be the next topic I, I want to talk about because a lot of things I would hear all of these. Um, these different, um, uh, you know, assertions about Lizzie Borden and things that she had done and things the family had done. Hey, okay, I hate to break this to you, but a lot of those details, um, some of these stories you've heard are, are just that. They're stories. None of that was ever talked about, from what we can tell, until long after the murders, years after the murders. And it's created quite a few, um, in my opinion, created quite a few myths. Um, in fact, no one knew much about the Bordens. They were seen as a respectable family. Um, it's true that Andrew was seen as a little bit, you know, tight on the dollar. Um, and, you know, and the, it was known the girls were, were misers. They had never married. Uh, you know, I mean, not misers, but, but were old maids. They had never married. But outside of that, there was no negative talk that we can tell um, and people that live contemporary said later, and there was never really any talk about the Bordens. So it was only after these mur these tragic murders, these horrible, grisly crimes, all of a sudden all of these weird stories started coming out. And that is just gossip and stories that got carried on. Now, a few of those that I'll mention is like, for instance, that, um, oh, well, she, you know, there was incest in the family um, that, uh, that, um, Andrew must have been doing was doing things with his daughters. That's the reason they didn't marry. That's the reason there was such a violent attack. And I'm going to go for that one again too later. Or well, I heard the one story, and this was I even seen a couple documentaries. It actually made it that far that oh, Lizzie liked to kill animals, uh, like she killed kittens and things and puppies, so that she with her friends, so that she could have mock play funerals as a little girl. You know. Um, and also another one that one that's really commonly accepted is that she was a shoplifter um and you know that one's very prevalent you may notice i never mentioned it in any of my other two videos why because there's no real evidence for it. it it was a rumor that came out they even had that in, in the movie the for you know in the in the um elizabeth montgomery movie from the 70s that you know and i've seen that in in documentaries that oh she was a shoplifter there's no evidence whatsoever that she's a shoplifter that left her until until like later on so I'm going to you know I'm going to cover all these now for one there was no talk of there's no record and there's no no t testament that Lizzie Borden ever killed killed animals to have these funerals and this story wasn't told until way after the crimes uh, and nobody's really sure where it comes from the incest thing there was never any talk of any type of incest in the family um, that you, that or, or any of that and uh, you know in the Victorian times true those type of things would not even be dreamed of but there doesn't seem to be any evidence for it either this is the, actually and that that theory didn't come out till many decades after the murders 
Um, and uh, you know, and an another one I'm, I'm um, I'll talk about is, and this one I see in a lot of documentaries is that, you know, the whole thing. And you notice I didn't say anything about it in either other videos about the um, the about the mutton stew that they had this mutton. Um, and then apparently they had it for like three or four days and it gone bad and he still made them eat, or eat it and they were all eating it and that's probably why they all got sick that day. And it's true, Bridget says she was having some stomach problems um, and everybody wasn't feeling very well. Food poisoning was very common in, in that, that age before refrigeration. However, that's not true. We know from some of the statements and the testimonies that Yes, they did have the lamb, but it had been made the day before. And also, something that was in Bridget's testimony, she said she talked about putting things in the ice box. They had an ice box. So, the, you know, this would have kept overnight. And a, a day, even though it's warm for it to go spoil, especially if they put it in an ice box, not, it, you know, it's not, you're not going to uh, give you food poisoning that easy. So, so th that that's purely a rumor. That's that 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 is not. It's not true. And like I said, I've seen a lot of documentaries. Which once again, you can always trust documentaries. <laughs> so you know a lot of these rumors, and I'm going to be going over that a little bit later as well. Now here, uh, I'd like to talk about the mysteries of the case to me. Now I don't want it to make it sound like, and maybe I give that impression over the last two videos that I have this all completely figured out. You know, well, obviously not. Uh, you know, it's still a mystery. I've given my uh, opinion ba and my opinion and my conclusions based on um, logic, based on looking at the timelines, based on looking, you know, at the, at the, what circumstantial evidence uh, exists, and it all still does point to Lizzie Borden. But there are still, and, and though I'm, I'm, it's with me, the mystery is not so much did she do it. I'm convinced she did it. About not probably like 98 percent. <laughs> convinced she did it but the the question is how she did it whether or not she did it is not not the mystery for me the mystery for me is why did she do it on that day and why did she do it the way that she did it a lot of that to me doesn't make a lot of sense for one you know on this particular what made her on this particular day want to to kill her parents number two why did she go about it the way that she did it? It seems very complicated and very, seems almost compulsive and very risky. I mean, we're talking about she's home, you know, she's home with the, with the maid and her mother. They're in the house, and she kills her mother with the maid just outside the house. She's going to be coming back in the house, you know, um, and she doesn't know who's going to come home. How does she know that the... The maid's not going to go up into that room. She's the maid. She cleans up. How's she not going to find that body dead and, and knowing that Lizzie's the only one in the house? You know, so uh, that doesn't seem that doesn't seem like a, a planned death. That seems something spontaneous and compulsive. You know, yeah, and and uh, as well as well as that, um, you know, with her father coming home, what why why you know why kill him in this way? Why not kill them in the night? Make it look like, you know, throw a window open. Make it look like a burglary. Not people would have bought that, and they she wouldn't be suspected. Also, why didn't you frame Bridget for this? You know, she's right there. She was Irish. There was a big uh, prejudice against Irish in, the, in, in that in Fall River. So people would have definitely, it's Victorian times, they definitely took her word um, over Bridget's. Uh, if she did, all she had to do is put and say Bridget did it, and nobody would have questioned it. She'd have been arrested, but she didn't. She actually said uh, Bridget wasn't around. So, you know, this is a very bizarre, very risky, and doesn't seem like a very well-timed plan. So, you know, kill your mother and leave her laying on the floor. Maid's wandering around the house. Your father comes home. Maid's still there, and you still, and you, and then you hack your, your father to death. This is a very bizarre, cr cr I think she did it. Why did she do it this way? Well, I can only speculate on some things. Once again, going by the evidence. Um, but I'll never know exactly, nobody's ever going to know exactly, what her original plan was. And if this is, you know, and, and what made her decide to do it that day and what prompted it that day. 
Uh, and I say the original plan because I don't think that the first part of this was planned. I think she did plan to do this. I think that she, that was already worked out in her head. But what set her off to do it then and the way she did it, we're never going to know. Only people are going to know that uh, are, are going to be Abby and, uh, and Lizzie, and they're both dead. So, And we're never going to know. All I can do is speculate. Um, for one, you know, uh, I think that something happened. Something was said, something that caused her to move into action. And from there, she had to improvise a plan. That's what I think happened. Now, what that was, I, we'll never know. She was not fond of her stepmother. There had been, they, she stopped calling her mother years before, called her Mrs. Borden over a dispute over some property. Um, she did not. She did not like her. She obviously saw her as a threat. So you know, I'm you know, I'm sure there was some tension between the two women. Once again, I'm just speculating. But um, you know, I I really would like to have known what happened. And in fact, everybody's like, oh, I wonder what Bridget, what secret Bridget took with her, what she saw, what, what, what was she part of it? I don't think she was part of it. But what I would love to have asked Bridget if I got to sit down and talk to her, it's like. Tell me about what kind of relationships was going on in that house. You know, how did the girls get along with, with Abby? How did they get along with her father? How did Abby and, uh, you know, Abby and Andrew get along? How did he get along with his daughters? What was the entry? What was, you know, uh, what was it like in that house? What was the relationships like in that household? That, I think, would have been gold to know. And Bridget, living there, working there for several, several years, she would have known all that. That's the what I, I would have asked. Hey, did you see her do it? I, no, I don't think she had a thing to do with it. But I would love to, the insight she would have had into the operations, and and the relationships, and the dynamic between these people would be gold to know. And unfortunately, she took it to the grave with her as well. Um, but now. As part of that, I would ask this question is that, you know, why did she pick that day to do this? I think it's very, uh, I think that it, it appears that it was something she had planned on doing. Um, there was the whole thing with the poison uh, that uh, she tried to buy some prussic, some prussic acid the day before, which is highly poisonous, since she wouldn't use it on a, on a uh, seal skin cape. Um, which that seems very, and they wouldn't give it to her because it is deadly poison. Um, so, and some statements she had made that she was afraid something was going to happen in the house. Uh, that may have been trying to get a cover up, you know, kind of set up a set up an alibi, set up a story. So I, you know, I do think that she, this was something she had planned to do, uh, and that she had thought about quite a bit. But why did she decide to do it that particular day? The only thing I can speculate and say is that I think that it was opportunity, uh, you know, and, and a perfect storm of situ the situation. For one, that is a narrow house. <laughs> it's like less than 20 feet wide, three stories, no doorways, and there are four people living in that house. So, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah well, five people technically, five with the maid. So you have five people living in that house. Um, there's not a lot of privacy, and you know these three women in the house. It would probably been getting being alone with someone, catching someone alone, was probably kind of a hard thing. Well, with Bridget outside, her father gone, this was an opportunity she was actually alone with her mother, and it may have been you know now or never type of deal. Also, the fact that her sister was out of town. I think it's a major major uh, component, as well as that her uncle had come to visit. I think these two elements is what made her decide that I'm doing this today. Because one, it takes her sister out of town and gives her an alibi and her sister will not be suspected, one. And two, if her sister didn't know about it, and we'll talk about that in a second, then that eliminates somebody that might have tried to talk her out of it. Or maybe even turn her in. You don't know. We don't, we'll never know. Um, so, in fact, but now, and it is true that Emma, until her dying day, even though her and Lizzie had a falling out, didn't speak for like 30 years, she still defended her sister and said that she didn't do it. Um, so, 
So that's one. She's got them out. And also the fact that her Uncle Morris is there. That's another man in the house. So in this type of grisly crime, she was a smart woman. A smart, she was a smart Victorian woman. She knew that she would not be suspected as long as there was a male suspect. I think that she thought, well, he's there. My sister's gone and Morris is here. And I'm not going to be suspected. I'm going to be alone with my mom. My stepmom. This is it's it's a this is the perfect day to do this. I think that that I I'll never know. Only Lizzie knows, and she's been gone a long time now. But that's my speculation. I think that she thought it's now or never. This is this is a perfect setup, or as good as it's going to get. Now, but still, it is so risky. You know, she chopped her, even though Bridget couldn't see what was going on. And people said, "Well, how didn't she see through the window?" Actually. Uh, Bridget's testimony gives a lot of clues for that. Because, well, once again, Bridget gave a lot of detail of what she was doing, you know, when she's outside washing the windows. And she says she washed all of the bottom windows first, not the top windows. And her mother was killed on the top floor. So there's no way she could have seen it. Everybody's like, well, how did she clean the window? Wouldn't she be looking around at the murder? No, she wasn't. The mother was killed around 9, 9 30 in the morning. At that time, she was drawing water and cleaning the outside windows on the first floor. So we, she couldn't have seen it. We know that from her own testimony. Um, but still, it is so risky. The maid, it's like I said, it's the maid. What keeps her from going upstairs and, and discovering this body and going screaming? Well, actually, once again, Bridget's testimony answers that. And I actually, was th after this question was brought to me, I started thinking about it and I remember something she said. When the prosecutor asked what her duties were, she said that she that uh, her duties did not include she was cl didn't clean did not include cleaning the bedrooms, only her own bedroom. That she said they did that themselves, meaning uh, meaning a Abby, Emma, and Lizzie. So she and Lizzie would have therefore right there in her own testimony, Lizzie would have known she was never going to go in that bedroom. That was not her job. And apparently, they didn't want her up there. You know, that, they didn't want her up there making the bed. So apparently, they didn't want her. Maybe they were afraid a maid might steal or whatever. We'll never know why. But they did not want her in the bedrooms. And Lizzie knew that. So Lizzie knew good and well that if she killed her mother in the bedrooms, Bridget was never going to go in there. That's the reason when her father come home, she gave the lie that her, her mother that her mother went out. And that's the reason Bridget didn't question it, because Bridget never went upstairs to the bedrooms. It's right in the testimony, as you see. Yeah, so right there shows, and then it shows another thing. If you live in any house, people speculating, oh, she couldn't have done this, couldn't have done that. Okay, you know, uh, how could she hide the weapon? Okay, think about your own house. <laughs> I'm thinking about mine here. Uh, I know the routine of this house. I know what time my fiance is going to get up. I know what time she's going to take the dog out. I know what she, you know uh, what time I'm going to get home. Hell, even the dog knows that. He's waiting for me by the door. So when you live in a house, like in your own house, you know the routine. You know what goes on. And I think, and nobody's going to know that house like uh, like that. People come later as investigators. They don't know that house the way Lizzie would have known that house and its routine. Just like with Bridget, she knew Bridget was never going to go come. Come, uh, come, go up into those bedrooms. So she knew she wasn't going to discover the bodies um, until her father come home. And you know, and as far as hiding the weapon, I can sit here and think of uh, at least five places in my house I could hide something. Nobody ever find it. <laughs> Loose board underneath a, a cabinet. There's a you know, and, and as we say with police, they're not very inept at. Uh, at searching as they showed and she may have even known that this was an intelligent woman everyone says that she was intelligent so she knew the routine of that house now why she decided to kill her her mother and leave her on the floor like that I think that that was sort of a set off thing I don't think she I think she planned to kill her but I don't think she planned to kill her like that I think I think that was a throw her off a little bit of her plan and another thing that I think throwed her off in her plan Whatever that plan was, was when her father come home early. They all said she'd come home early. And of course, the first thing he asked 
was where's Mrs. Borden? So she had to make this impromptu lie. I think that was a flaw in the slaw of her plan. I think she was she killed her her, her mother upstairs. She's going to wait for her father to come home and kill him. You know, um, and for for whatever reason, when he come home early, that messed it up. She had to make up this lie. She had to make up this lie in front of the maid. You know, oh, well, she got a sick note and she went out. In fact, she told that both to her father and to uh, and to Bridget. So, you know, whatever the plan was, I think that the father throwed that off. That's when we had that lie. So, um, so that's the way I think that 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 she did it. She she knew that Bridget wasn't going to come in that room. She killed her with the axe. She didn't leave her laying there. No worry, the maid's not going to go upstairs and see her. And then whatever, but whatever her plan was to kill her father, that's the question. Um, and also the fact that perhaps she knew that Bridget would take a nap every day. May, that's something I would like to have asked Bridget. Did you know you went upstairs to take a nap? Was that a common thing? Did you go take a nap before, before, just before lunch? Was that a common thing for you to do every day? I would have loved to have known that. If I'd known that, that would answer it all. That would have showed the plan. She could kill her father upstairs knowing Bridget would never go upstairs and she'd know that her father would that Bridget would go lay down and we, we know it was a common thing for her father to lay down before lunch so right there she would have known she'd have had that moment alone with him that Bridget was never going to go 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 in those bedrooms she used the back stairs up to her room and it's a servant you know she's a servant she used the servant's uh, stairwell and she so she was safe to kill the mother and when her father come home, she knew that Bridget would be upstairs and she'd be alone with him. So I do think that that was that was the plan. Uh, you know, if if she, uh, the, which only thing I wish I knew is like I said, did Bridget take a nap like that every day? Was that part of the routine? I think Lizzie Borden used this routine to get away with this murder, to commit and get away with this murder. Now another question that I got on. Uh, of the people that lived in that house was about once again about Emma not about whether she did it but was she in on it was there collusion was she aware of what her sister was going to do and did they plan for her to be out of town that day for her to commit this murder truth is we'll never know is that possible yes it is possible and the only two people that would know that uh, are are both long gone only thing to do is speculate once again and yeah, I, and I've, I've thought about it a lot, and it is convenient that she had to go out of town that day and that her uncle showed up at that time. I think that's just maybe a little bit too much of a coincidence. But if Emma knew about it, then, or at least collusion to some, not so much conspiracy, but maybe collusion, maybe she knew she did it, um, but, you know, she just, it was a don't ask, don't tell thing. Um, we're never going to know. Is it possible? Yeah, I think it's possible. Now, all I can say is, is that that Emma stuck by her sister um, through the, through it all, believed in her innocence, and professed her innocence even after after uh, they had a falling out thirty years. So, if it was an act on on Emma's on from Emma's point, then she did a damn good job. But the truth is, you know, is it possible? Yeah, it is possible. Uh, do I think it's possible? I'm really, I don't think there's enough information to really make a verdict on that or even an educated guess. Yes, it's possible that she knew about it um, and that, she, you know, they may have conspired it together or it may have just been, you know, kind of a silent, I'll go out of town this week. Okay, sis. Okay. And they both know exactly what's going to go down. <laughs> Uncle's coming and um, I'm going to go out of town. Okay. Okay may have been like that and that just some things just don't need to be spoken <laughs> to be known and that may have been the case I love we'll never now the last thing and I do mean the last thing I want to talk about with Lizzie Borden is something that I find a little bit um, fascinating and that's actually the sociology in this uh, in this case with Lizzie Borden now this kind of harkens back to the rumors um, uh, about Lizzie and and the speculations about Lizzie, you know, the, like for instance, you know, um, 
Was there incest in the family? Um, was was there was was there a lesbian an affair in the fa between um, Lizzie and 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 Bridget? Um, you know, uh, you know, uh, they, you know, was she? Did she torture animals? Did she shoplift? All of these things. That they uh, they they harken back to something that I, I I want you to kind of pay attention to whenever you're watching documentaries or movies about Lizzie Borden, because the fact is. We know very little about the private lives of the Bordens and about the private lives uh, or, or the motivations of Lizzie Borden. She was very tight-lipped on that. In her, in her older age, you know, she, she was, because everyone assumes she's guilty, she was very closed-mouthed, pretty much stayed to herself. Uh, she loved her animals. She did have some friends, uh, but she never talked about the murders. Uh, she, you know that was never you know that was never brought up really brought up uh, so uh, and she was a very private person after that you can't really blame her um, but because of that she Lizzie Borden has kind of become a blank slate uh, and when I said by which people can put project any ideal that they want on her and that has happened time and time again uh, you know any type of Socio, political, even political viewpoint on Lizzie Borden. She becomes a poster girl for a lot of different issues, especially issues surrounding feminism and women. Um, for instance, you know, during the time that was going on, um, she got a lot of support from the suffragette movement. You know, the the women's rights to vote movement. They saw this. They're persecuting a woman. You know, they're using her as a scapegoat. Women have been u been used by men and all of this. They, you know, they're trying to pass off this murder. So she, they really used her as a poster, a poster girl for 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 men uh, oppressing women. You know, and keeping us from the vote and, and the legal process. You know, so she became this suffragette hero. And that was even during her lifetime, during the trials. Of course, they abandoned her right after. Um, but as you get on later on into like the the 1960s, it suddenly she became, you know, 60s and the 70s, she gets to be a a symbol for, um, you know, an ambitious woman for a woman that took charge. She was in a bad situation. She had a miserly father. You know, she was under this oppressive system, and even though radical and maybe not and not moralistic this is a woman that that did what she had to do to get her own financial and you know and social uh liberation and she become this poster girl for the women for for the the 1960s and 70s women's rights movement you know okay and you know and in fact and you see that especially in the um in the legend for lizzie borden they kind of showed that that this was uh, this was a, a woman taking charge in a, in, in a an oppressive uh, patri pat patriarchal society. Um, then, of course, when you get into the and it was th now this was also kind of hinted at in in the legend uh, of um, Lizzie Borden. But in the eighties, it become uh, the eighties and nineties, it become a big time speculation was that maybe there was some. This was the time period in the, in the late seventies and in the eighties. Uh, we had a lot of child abductions and then a lot of child molestations like with the priesthood and all this child molestation and incest had become really to the forefront socially. It was, it was a hot button topic. Well, all of a sudden, maybe Liz, you know, reason Lizzie hacked in his face and hacked his eye in half because that was an eye that may have seen her in some compromised situation or some shameful situation. And that's the reason for her, her, her rage. So suddenly... Uh, Lizzie became, becomes an abused child striking out, you know, you know um, and then of course, you know, you get on up also in the 90s and getting on up into the present time, you know, this is a time that a lot of gay rights, you know, LB, LBGQT um, um, issues were coming up and gay, you know, gay rights. Suddenly you get a lot of these stories of that uh, Lizzie was probably a lesbian. You know, her sister. The reason her sister moved out was because she, because you know, she was having lesbian, having lesbian affairs. Uh, you know, um, and then people really speculate. And you see that in the in in the movie Lizzie. Um, you know, um, 
uh, well, by which her and Bridget are having the affair. And that's where these rumors and these stories come from. You know, that uh, Lizzie was having an affair. There was an incest between her, her and her father, you know, um, and, and, uh, you know, and also that she was a shoplifter. That's one I didn't go over. There was actually that she was a shoplifter. You always hear that. When actually, there's no evidence she was a shoplifter. There was an incident. I'll just say this real quick. There was an incident um, about about uh, in, in uh, 1897, several years after the murder and her acquittal, acquittal by which um, she g gave a gift of, of a plate to a friend. The plate, the plate got damaged. She took it back to the store where Lizzie had got it to be repaired. And they claimed, oh, we had two plates that were shoplifted that were stolen from here. So they had put a, 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 a warrant out for Lizzie's arrest. But when they talked to Lizzie, Lizzie's like, no, I went in there and I paid for them. Um, and apparently, and the store dropped the charges. They, they dropped the whole thing. Either Lizzie went ahead and paid for it or may have been a, a clerical error. Maybe the guy just didn't record that it was... Uh, that he had sold it, and there was this mistake made. Either way, the whole thing was dropped. But oh, the papers got a hold of it, and all of a sudden, Lizzie was a shoplifter. She is a shop thief. I've seen this in documentaries. No evidence for this at all, except for this plate incident, which nobody pursued, and apparently was was taken care of. So there, that's there is no evidence for this. And that's the type of things I say. But you see it in the movies. You see it in these documentaries that she was a, she was a, 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 a thief. You know, um, but anyway, as I was saying, back to to the thing, um, the the uh, the whole thing with Lizzie, uh, you know, be, possibly being lesbian, and also like in the the um, the in the Lizzie movie with Chloe Sevigny, you see that she is uh, she really emphasizes that she is a woman, you know, an, a woman that's being taken advantage of through institutional uh, misogyny. You know, and assault when men just assaulting women. There's a scene where Uncle tries to like uh, sexually assault her in the hallway, and there's nothing she can do about it. So once again, it's back to this uh, oppressive men, men and and sexually assaulting men, and the powerlessness uh, of women, and that she took back that power violently from being assaulted. And this comes right at the same time we're having all these issues with the uh, with, with uh, the accusations coming out through the Me Too movement. You know, and suddenly Lizzie is a poster girl for the Me Too movement. So every single social issue of the times, they they put on Lizzie Borden. So whenever you hear some of these stories or some of these theories or some of these movies and documentaries, look at the times that they were made, the documentaries or the movies, and what was the, the social hot buttons at the time. And you will find that they've put these, suddenly Lizzie Borden has become the poster girl for every uh, fe feminist and er every, um, um, you know, uh, um, uh, chauvinistic um, movement that's out there. She's, she's, she, has be she has become not even the person but a symbol for all of these issues. And I find that very interesting. Now, do I think that any of these re reflect the real Lizzie Borden? Not really. <laughs> I mean, from you know, once again, Lizzie Borden was a very private person, so we can only go by her actions, both before and after, and the era she lived in. For one, she was, from all reports and people that knew her, she she was a very calculating person. She was a very, um, um, uh, very stern person. But she also, it was known that, like her father, she had, she did know that to be rather arrogant, and she had a temper uh, when she was younger. She, you know, um, a little bit fiery. Uh, that was one. Two, she was also very big into prim and proper, like a, the, like a Victorian, like of a typical Victorian woman of the time. She taught Sunday school. She did all the things that a woman in her position that wasn't married would do. Um, you, you know, so. So, uh, you know, she seems very, not, does she, there's no evidence she's ever got involved in the suffragette movement at, there, during her lifetime. Um, you know, she seems to have enjoyed pretty things and nice things. In fact, uh, after the, the murders, you know, she bought that, the big nice house. She changed her name to Elizabeth of Maplecroft, which I believe people thought was very both conceited and, and, and uh, pretentious as hell, <laughs> and I agree with them. Um, so, you know, and she had, she, she bought the best clothes, she bought the best 
uh, you know, furniture and furniture her house. She had a coachman. She had servants, a winter winter bedroom, a summer bedroom, a library. So what does these things tell us about Lizzie Borden? That Lizzie Borden was a Victorian woman who was had was uh, considered an old maid for her time. Um, she goes. She got involved in the social things she could get involved with, and she wanted the good life. She wanted the. She wanted pretty things. She wanted a nice house. She wanted the accoutrements of wealth, and I think I don't think her motive had anything to do with incest or being a lesbian or being, um, uh, you know, or or uh, trying to stick it to the man type of thing. I think it, it. They say you know when it comes to murder, follow the money. And one of the number one motives, and I think that was it. She wanted the the life of accoutrements and wealth, and the person that was standing in the way of her getting that was her stepmother and her father, and they both, and they were both put out of the way so she could have Maplecroft, so she could become Elizabeth instead of Lizzie. And her legal name was Lizzie, uh, and that she could have have uh, that uh, that social standing. That she wanted to get, she wanted to be a person up on the hill and in the society, in, in in the upper crust society. Those are her motives. I don't think I don't see any social, you know, so, any sexual or social or political move um, uh, motive in what she did whatsoever. But yet, she, bec she has become the poster girl for all these movements. I find that very, I find that as almost as interesting as the murders. Now, the last of these rumors and these speculations that I'll go over is the one about her wh whether or not Lizzie was a lesbian. Um, and you know, I don't know if she was a lesbian or not. Now, it is true that she she never did marry. She doesn't seem to have ever had a boyfriend, and in today's world, that would be suspect. But that's in today's world, not in the Victorian era. You know, um, back then, you know. Uh, if a woman didn't marry to a certain age, she didn't marry, and that was the way it was in her, you know, in her time. She was a she was a woman from a good family. She she um, she missed her opportunities to get married probably because of where her father where she lived, and she wasn't in with the society, and she was expected to marry a man of a certain status that didn't ever come along. Both her and her sister, and and I think that's very telling. It's not just, if it just be one, you'd be like, well, maybe. Maybe she wasn't interested in men, but both the sisters, and they're both old maids. That says to me there's something, something socioeconomic going on, not something as far as as attraction and sexual. Um, so, I, you know, I don't see any evidence that she was the lesbian. That's been pointed out that when her sister moved out, she went to a reverend to talk about what was going on. And the reverend said, you must, with this type of situation, you must leave immediately. He treated it, you know, that this, you know, they didn't say what, you know, what it was, but it was very important that she immediately get out of that house and get out of that influence of what was going on. You know, so obviously something very scandalous. A lot of people have read that in, too, that maybe Emma caught Lizzie in some sort of sexual affair um, and that she... You know, and that she went to the pastor, and she she was totally, you know, told him, "Get you, oh God, get out! You got to get out of there." That is more of an interpretation from our age, from our time, not Victorian times. In Victorian times, there are many things that today we would see as nothing. I mean, below nothing, not even an issue that they'd have found horribly scandalous. So that reaction could be something much more benign. For instance, more likely, we do know that Lizzie, after, you know, she couldn't get friends or have friends. Most all of her friends abandoned her in the town. After, the, after, the, after she was acquitted, everybody assumed she's murdered and she's blacklisted, you know, ostracized from the town the rest of her life. So she went out of town. She calmly went to the, and she loved to go to the theater. She loved the theater. So she'd go to the theater to see these plays in Boston. And she made friends with the troops. Apparently, they, they, she was much more forgiving or, or not as judgmental. And she made friends with, these the, with the theater people, the actors and theater troops. And she would invite them back over to the house 
um, to her house for, for parties. And there's one named Nance O'Neill who actually lived up into to be in some of the some of the even the talkie films. Who she became very close friends with. Now it was rumored that um, that Nan Nance O'Neill was possibly lesbian, um, but now. Does that mean that, that we, we don't know if her and Lizzie had some sort of relationship or if it was just a friendship? But when you consider, the, at that time, actors and theater people were seen socially, especially in a town like Fall River, as being a, 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 um, equivalent to prostitutes and thieves. They were the most low left. You did not associate good, good Christian girls, good Victorian women did not associate with such people. It's always right to go to the theater, but you didn't invite them to your house. Oh my God! So the she could have just as easy, rather than saying a lesbian thing, she could just as easily went into the preacher and said, "She keeps bringing these theater people into the house, and they're serving drinks to the." And he'd be like, "You've got to get out of there." That's just as legitimate as if you're saying that that she there's some sort of lesbian thing. And I think that. Considering the situation, it's probably something more like that. We've got to be careful about applying um, sensibilities of today to sensibilities in, in uh, over uh, you know well over a hundred years ago in the Victorian era. They're wholly different things. So I think that this is could just likely been uh, she got tired of the publicity. Lizzie, you know, what, this is only uh, within like 10, 15 years, was uh, 2000, uh, I mean 1902, 1903 when she left. So the crime was still fresh in people's minds. She was still notorious. I'm sure there were still reporters coming around, people coming to gawk at them. Plus, she's bringing home theater people. I think that um, Emma's like, I can't handle this, and I'd like to have a little bit of a private life, and she left. And they had a split. I think that's just as legitimate as some sort of, uh, of, of her being a lesbian. Was she a lesbian? You know, what, what, um, I have no idea. But I don't think there's any evidence saying that she was, that we know of. Okay, folks, that is it. That is the last Lizzie Borden uh, video I'm doing. I've said it, I'm done. <laughs> no more. <laughs> I, you know, once and for all, the last video on Lizzie Borden. I hope you've enjoyed the three of them. If you haven't seen the other two, go back and, uh, you know, you can check my list. I'll actually put a link up here above to the last one. You know, and go back and enjoy them. I still would love to hear comments about them. If you have any questions, I'd love to discuss them, so long as it's done in a respectful manner. Uh, you know, I, I, I still leave the, keep it going, but I'm telling you, I'm done with doing Lizzie Borden. The, the Bordens are all dead. It's still a fascinating mystery. And I think I've said, I have finally said my complete piece on it. Okay? So, uh, but once again, if you're enjoying these videos, both of my more satirical ones as well as these about, about um, true crimes and other issues, then please hit that little subscribe button down there and, and, and give me a like and give me a subscribe. I'd love to have you. Um, and you know what? Until I see you next time, you stay pretty. Mm -hmm.